thanks for being here, uh, Jay. Um, would you like to introduce yourself uh, briefly and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, Flora Cooperative? For sure. Yeah. So uh, my name is Jay, uh, Jason Giles out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, I go by Jay. Uh, and we started Flora Cooperative in 2019. We're one of the only worker owned cooperatives and a unionized worker worker owned cooperative in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so currently going through a little bit of restructuring um, and um, working on our uh, sort of CBA, it gets a little, getting a little in the weeds, but um, that we can talk about how uh, unions and worker owned cooperatives function or how we've, you know, kind of uh, worked around or worked through that process, um, if that's helpful. Yeah, well, um, to start off, uh, you know, I was looking at your website, uh, this morning. And one of the things that really struck me as uh, somewhat unique was the wide range of things that uh, services that you guys offer, everything from house painting and putting up wallpaper to doing graphic design, uh, printing services, uh, which seems like a, you know, a very broad range of services, uh, you know, compared to what most small businesses uh, uh, offer. Um, so I was kind of wondering how that ended up happening. I don't know if that's part of what's changing now. Um, but, and then I also had, you know, had noticed that as you guys are doing more than, you know, working in a couple of different industries, you're also members of a couple of different unions. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, anyway, uh, it, but if you could just, you know, maybe start out by telling us how you ended up with such a diverse set of offerings in your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, well, I've been in the sort of residential, like commercial painting and um, carpentry uh, realm or industry f for a long part of my uh, adult life. And uh, then really was start so that industry in particular, particularly the uh, um, light commercial to residential is often uh, non unionized. There's it's uh, rife with exploitation. Um, a lot of subcontracting and misclassification uh, occurring. Uh, it's a lot of it's racialized. And uh, uh, so one idea we had, so Flora kind of grew out of uh, uh, the industrial workers of the world, the Milwaukee branch, uh, a number of members that were interested in sort of the idea of a worker owned cooperative or a union worker owned cooperative. And um, we sort of since that was my main industry and being uh, sort of, uh, you know, growing up through it and then becoming like an estimator project coordinator um, in the in that um, we decided to sort of create flora uh, out of that. Um, you know, we, we brought on a cleaner. Uh, so we started doing mostly residential um, cleaning, but then also doing some sort of mid construction and post construction cleaning for some of the uh, general contractors that we have worked for. Um, and at, I believe it was in 2021, uh, another IWW member who uh, mostly does graphic design and water-based screen printing uh, came on board and we uh, formulated a DBA doing business as in the state of Wisconsin, which we found out we could do. Um, at first, we didn't know that cooperatives could actually do that. So just to kind of brand it differently, we have shaky hands screen printing, um, which focuses mostly on screen printing, though recently we've um, got a, a digital printer uh, and plotter um, for banners, uh, custom wallpaper, murals, um, stickers, vinyl, uh, window treatments, things like that. So we're able to do, that's basically a large format digital printer. So we sort of integrated that into Flora more broadly and Shaky Hands is, is specifically screen printing, although we overlap, you know, in terms of services. So we're able to, to do all that in the printing world. Um, so currently we have painting, wall covering, cleaning and printing. So that's a little bit of a background. <laughs> Hey, do do y'all know if um if there are more IW, IWW wor worker co-ops or co-ops? Because I think I asked again. I usually ask like every two years or something, but yeah. I haven't gotten a response yet. Yeah, uh, 
I don't know of any specifically. They do have a closed shop form, a cooperative form. So actually, we were just talking about that recently in the office um, because um, of getting that form up to date, really what we need to do. But, um, you know, we have like crossover membership between uh, IWW and the other two unions. But um, the uh, so, so I don't know uh, of any offhand, but they do have this form, which I can link. Um, it's pretty interesting because it's a way of. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, we should interview any like IWWs who are trying to like get more serious about the IWW having more worker co-ops. I mean, they got the forms to integrate into the, you know, to register as a co-op with the union, but I'll see. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, and, 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 and how many different unions? I, I think I saw at least two on your website that you guys were members of. Right, so we're in the... More? Uh, yeah, so currently we're working through our CBA with the... Um, IUPAT, which is the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Um, and then we do have a CBA or contractual bargaining agreement with uh, PPPWU. They just changed their name. So it's the Packaging Printers and Production Workers Union. Uh, that's where we get the Allied bug, um, which is sort of the coveted printing bug uh, that's on uh, a lot of. Um, so, so that, 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 that. Um, is uh something um that we were hoping to get and we'd, we were hoping to sort of connect more broadly to the uh you know different unions in uh pppw and iupat are both in the afl cio um and then uh we have a lot of members who are in iww as well so uh we haven't really promoted iww per se on our website we have in the past but um i just did some updates and it, it's currently not on there um and we're trying to figure some of that out right now actually because um anyway not to get too into the weeds but we're just trying to figure out like we might we're we're talking with iupat about and, and some other folks about doing a uh, an, another creating a local out of iupat that would be focused on cooperators uh freelancers artists cultural workers and um and other precarious forms of labor that would be more of a broad net uh local so we're trying to figure out how to iupat wants us to do that because and i can go into some of those details as to why but um the the painters portion of the union their own that local is extremely it's ex very expensive uh so like healthcare is really really expensive so it's hard for a small shop to really gain access to those benefits and since we're a democratically run firm you know we have to allocate quite a bit of money per worker to towards the uh towards the um health insurance benefits it's almost like 60 percent of the of the of the actual um benefits package so you know when you're talking about a democratically run firm you know creating collaborating on this contractual bargaining agreement, it, it, it looks differently than if you have sort of more of a top down, you know, like if you've got a mid size commercial painting company, right? It's like, for them, it makes sense. Cause it's like, all right, we, here's our bill rate. Here's the wage rate and benefits package for each painter. Um, and, but they're, they're, they're looking at much larger contracts than we currently are. Uh, and they're doing, uh, like I said, more commercial work so they can s sustain that level of benefits where it's harder for us to do in residential like commercial. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, very interesting to me specifically because I spent about seven, eight years uh, doing exactly that you know, house painting in that that same sector being, you know, misclassified, um, probably being exploited by, I would say, not by the guy who was hiring me directly, probably by the uh, general contractor. I think he was, you know, generally exploiting all of us. Um, uh, yep. So that's, you know, that's great uh, to hear that, you know, you guys have managed to put together a worker co-op. Um, uh, they're, uh, you know, doing that and have also gotten, you know, connected with the union. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, I'll turn. You got any any other questions about Flora before we move on? Um, nah, I seen your van. The van, the van looks pretty slick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not on the site. Or is it on your social media? Uh, yeah, it's on the social media. We have it on our Instagram. <laughs> yeah, the pretty slick van. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and where are you <laughs> sitting at right now, Jay? 
Uh, it looks like you're at one of the businesses, maybe. Yeah, we're. At, I'm at the the main shop. So, our shop to, in the back. We've got kind of a. Chris has been up here. Um, what was that last summer, right? Uh, in, uh, I know for. I don't know if we came here during Mildred Fish Harnack uh, event, but. Yeah, I think so. no, no, not not during that event, but I think prior. When did I see it? I think I saw it in the early last year. Okay. On the summer. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got um, screen printing out of here. Our painting, painting and cleaning materials and supplies are here. Uh, we have got a storage area in the basement. We've got the man parked out back, and then we. This also doubles as an IWW union space. Uh, also, Cooperation Milwaukee, which has a lot of crossover membership with uh, both Flora and IWW, <laughs> so it's it's a uh, sort of a mixed use space. But um, yeah, so you might see the digital printer here behind us, which is a big, um, beautiful. <laughs> uh, we got it used, which is great because these things new are like fifteen to twenty thousand, so we got it for around fifty five hundred, and then. Uh, over in the corner there we've got the uh that's the plotter so that cuts all the the stickers or vinyl um it's very f able to do like fine cutting of um both so if you were to get into like mass producing stickers or something like that then you wouldn't want this necessarily because uh they've got different cutters for that that are about i don't know five to eight grand or something like that uh new and those will like sort of really cut but it's kind of like we're, we're, we're trying to kind of figure out where we fit um because it's like kind of a new market for us completely so um yeah stickers are not necessary there's so much competition in printing too which is another thing so you might notice we're like we're in industries that are uh very very competitive in a lot of ways um so presenting a cooperative you know union cooperative alternative i think is really important um, but also it, it, you know, we're not dealing with, um, as high of bill rates, like, as, like I was mentioning earlier, like in commercial painting, you know, firms might be charging a hundred to $110 an hour. Right. And then they've got their benefits package, for instance, and our local is like $64 an hour. That's with all your benefits per worker. So painters, when they go through the, um, apprentice and journey person uh sort of program and, and come out as journey people they're they're making like you know 40 dollar base wage and then they've got 24 dollars in benefits um so those benefits their pensions are really nice when they end up like leaving you know the sort of industry some of them are making like 80 to 100 thousand a year i've heard like after they you know so they, they've carved out a nice you know sort of a, a program for them for, for themselves in that apprenticeship oh that is that is amazing to hear i am definitely going to be forwarding this interview to my uh buddies who are still in the construction trades because that is a huge thing especially you know with painting as you know it's like you're you know running a roller all day mm -hmm. uh your shoulders after a couple decades of that are yeah. worn out and mm -hmm. uh and it's a yeah it's a big question for a lot of guys even who are not, you know, misclassified independent contractors like I was, but, you know, actually running their own companies, mm -hmm. they're still working. They're still out there doing the actual work and they don't know <laughs> what they're going to do. And they, and they definitely don't have an $80,000 a year or even $50,000 a year pension waiting for them. So that you've right. managed to figure out how to do that um, is super impressive. So, uh, I mean, congratulations on, <laughs> on just that that task of organizing uh because i definitely talked worker co-ops with people in the construction trades and it was it was it was rough uh, you know to try to get that the uh the organization part down so mm -hmm. that's that's really good to hear um i'm also interested in you know you've got all these different things going on between the printing and the cleaning and the and the painting and the wallpapers uh so how do you organize yourselves internally in terms of governance are you kind of little work teams and then everyone has a as a representative on a board or do you uh have kind of big team meetings or with the whole company or what do you do 
Right. So, well, currently we have, uh, so our, the way we kind of have it set up and some of this was inspired by value cooperative, uh, the Vancouver artist and labor union cooperative out of uh, Vancouver, BC. Um, so, cause we, we, we had some talks with them early on, probably in late, late 2019 or early to mid 2020. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of unique in the sense that their cooperative is also the local uh, of their union. So this kind of brings us up to speed to where we're kind of, you know, kind of maybe broadening uh, sort of that idea of a local and cooperatives, um, blending the two more, um, uh, I guess you would say, it may be, may be a little bit more indecipherable from an outside perspective or something, but they, they sort of have a category. They have got like worker associate, which are folks that come in and they work on a project, right? And they, they're not really interested in, in worker, uh, you know, in, in any of the internal governance or anything like that, but they might be, you know, later on. But, um, and then there's a worker collaborator cat category there that they have, which is somebody who comes on and, um, uh, works towards worker ownership, you know, so that they might uh, be less project based and come on more as like a part to full time employee of the co op. Um, and then you have worker ownership. So in our model, we have a worker collaborative category. So we kind of used parsed from their um, sort of structure and then uh, worker own worker owners. So currently we have three worker owners and then we have um, five, five or six painting, painting, apprentice, I should say seven, seven, um, painting apprentices that are going through the, uh, uh, apprentice, um, uh, uh, program. And then we have, um, currently we have one cleaner and then we have two, uh, and, and she's also a worker owner. Um, and then we have the two, two, um, screen printers. And one of them also works with, uh, uh, Sophia and I um, on the digital printing side. So uh, right now we have weekly meetings with the, with the worker owners, and then we have like monthly meetings with with the painters. And it's sort of like each division, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, has their own meetings, right? So uh, each week, though, uh, all three worker owners get together, and we kind of just talk over everything. Um, I can uh, give you guys. Um, I think Chris, you might have a copy of our bylaws. Um, oh yeah, I do. Well, so, I, I don't know, y'all are. I know you've you've. Changed. I think at the time you had recently changed them or something. Are you on your? Are you editing them again? Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a living document. Um, the kind of the issue we found is like you know tempering skill with um, skill and and interest and capacity with you know uh involvement in the in the sort of economic democracy of the, of the firm itself um and and making it so that it's uh you know feels kind of organic um and and not like you know uh, also one thing we're trying to combat against to a certain extent is in, in particularly in painting uh and, and somewhat in cleaning uh uh maybe printing a little less so but is um a, 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 you know a lot of people like painters kind of have um, enclosed their skill in a sense for, for um, within the capitalist system, you know, so in a way that like, it's like, okay, well, I can float from firm to firm to firm. I can maybe take off. Maybe I've made enough money over the summer and I can take off for a little bit of time. So it's like, we, you know, obviously we want to be able to, um, for people to feel like they can kind of come and go to a certain extent, but then also like, uh, merge that with their involvement in the uh, cooperative ed enterprise. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how many members, well, you said you have three uh, worker members and then how many people uh, do you think are employed there altogether? Um, so currently, and currently we're, all, we're, we got really slow this winter. So many folks are laid off. Uh, but still going to the apprenticeship program. So we've got six that are still going to the apprenticeship program. Um, and then we've got uh, six painters that are going to the apprenticeship program, two printers, and then three worker owners. So that's that. Right. Uh, 12? Yeah. 
<laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, oh, great. Um, all right. Chris, do you have any other questions about Flora or... Jay, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, well, so just one thing that I think is um, unique for co-ops and, you know, with that, uh, with the, you know, working with unions is trying to figure out, and we've, I've been popping in on some of the calls with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops on um, the Union Co-ops Council, and there's a lot, each CBA, each union has its own like you know contractual bargaining agreement that they're trying to put together with the firm and they're used to dealing kind of with a top-down you know hierarchical situation um so a lot of them the 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 organizers with those unions are particularly the trade unions they're like set up for like top-down organizing which is sort of obviously the quite different than like the I, iww model of like bottom up and um Although they do do salting and they try to organize non-unionized shops and things like that, it is very much driven um, sort of by the relationship with the boss or managers and trying to get them to sign uh, the CBA. Uh, so that is one thing that, you know, we'd like to be able to help other co-ops navigate. Um, some unions are just easier than others, like PPPWU is much, um, much easier because they have a lot of like owner operated small um print shops right whereas like uh in the painting industry most of the um sort of lion's share of work is going to these larger um firms you know that might employ you know 30 to 50 to 150 uh painters right so uh it just sort of like changes the dynamic when you're trying to as i mentioned earlier like you know uh arrive at democratic like arrive at consensus around some of these things you know because if, if each person has uh their own sort of perspective on things the the union like like i said earlier like the cba works great if you go through the journey person program and then you just go work for, and you can work for different firms and you can kind of come and go labor has a lot of um, autonomy in that situation and is able to uh be a little bit more fluid and their and their benefit package follows them to each firm right so uh but when you're when we're, we're talking about like um a smaller firm you know cooperatively run firm it becomes a little bit different because maybe we don't want to pay into such a huge you know healthcare uh uh cost you know what i mean so and and you can't really do that within the confines of the cba because then it becomes like oh why why did why does that firm not not have to pay for the benefits but like you know we all have to um so you know you get into things like that um so hopefully um sort of our experience and others in the union co-op co council can help sort of um with some of those things so that there are more union co-ops you know because i think merging the two uh just makes sense and i i've i've read and heard that like all over the world essentially like the us is of course the outlier <laughs> almost all co-ops are like unionized all around the world. So definitely something we got to work on. I, I, I remember there was, um, was it like in 2020, there was the, uh, like state of the sector or something like that, that report for co-ops. And I think that one of the things that the worker co-ops were, uh, really in, in need of was better healthcare access. Right. And, one thing I was just kind of wondering right now is like, where is there a good place where a lot of these conversations are, are taking place, especially where um, people might be able to to band together to um, solve these problems? Um, yeah, if you have an answer to this as well, Josh, I'm kind of curious. Well, I'll give you my perspective from kind of the, the armchair economist, which is the real problem for U.S. worker co-ops in providing health care for their members is that we live in the U.S. And that's a real problem for everybody. And there is no good health care, really, unless you, you can really shell out for it. And so, I you know, it's, it's not, I don't see it as a knock against worker co-ops so much as just like a knock against our society in general. And until we have it figured out for everybody, it's going to continue to be a, an issue. You know, I, it's like a 
I can't imagine $64 an hour just for, you know, healthcare. That's ridiculous. I've never made anywhere close to that. Um, <laughs> you know, total. It's, so. it, I should say it's 60, $64, at least in the Milwaukee local is that, mm -hmm. that, that include, that includes their base wage and then $24 of which, uh, is allocated to skills training, healthcare insurance, and then pension. But okay, twenty four dollar benefits package. I think it's like around sixteen dollars per hour goes to healthcare. Okay, so, yeah, and, still. Yeah. <laughs> when I was painting houses, I was making fifteen bucks an hour. So yep. kind of tells you how. I mean, yeah, things have gotten, uh, yeah, yeah, way out of hand. Um, I know there are some worker co ops that. Uh, or at least one that I can think of offhand that I know has a really great health insurance uh, program. I don't know if they've been able to keep it up till today. It's been probably 10 years since I, I saw this, but uh, it's the Alvarado Street Bakery. Um, and uh, they're, I think, in Washington State somewhere. Um, but they have, yeah, an amazing, you know, coverage. I've watched some little short documentary or something on them and talked about how they, you know, by come down with brain cancer, it's like a, you know, $20 copay and, and that's it. So, um, you know, it is possible, but they've also been around for a long time. I know, you know, it's like, if you're trying to, you, you know, you might've been able to get a good uh, deal 20 or 30 years ago that you got grandfathered in or something, but uh, it's harder to, to come up with today. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, and the USFWC, I have to say, like, I mean, props to them for taking a stab at this, but it doesn't seem like they've really figured out anything better than just like kind of here's Obamacare, you know, websites where you're at and, 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 uh, um, which again, it's a, it's a problem for our, our nation right. as a whole. Um, so. Yeah. I thought I read, I, I could be totally wrong about this, but I thought I read something a long time ago where supposedly like one of the, like, uh, some of the prominent unionists in the 30s or 40s. Um, I don't know if, if it happened during that time period, but at some point they were opposed to the idea of national health care because they said it would destroy the power of the, 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 it would destroy a lot of leverage that the unions could have or did have. I don't know if that's true or not, but so I got to try to find where I might have read that and see if that stuff is true. Yeah. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Yeah, I have actually. Um... It was a while ago, but yeah, I, I I could see I could see how that would like the logic behind it, like locally and regionally. Um, but on the other hand, part of the you know part of the way the boss's tool is to you know uh, make you dependent upon them for your health care. So then you know that's that's an argument for against like socialized. <laughs> um state subsidized uh you know healthcare because then like well i don't need to stay at this firm i can go somewhere else right carry my insurance like a portable insurance plan and actually like that is interesting because if you think about it you know going through the journey journey journeyman a uh, journey person like uh uh apprentice program like labor like i said earlier it's like lab like labor in this case is relatively like autonomous because they can they can go particularly like wall cover covers are like coveted right so it's like if you if you're a painter and you can do wallpaper then it's like the bigger firms want you like they get a huge project and they're like okay come on so you can kind of float you know and your package is portable right so it's like mm -hmm. it moves along with you so it's like labor has a lot of um i don't know i guess i would say like self-directed autonomy in that situation now it also can lead to, to in my opinion to sort of a anti-solidaristic sort of mindset you know like more of a hyper individualized mindset where people are like oh well i've got the skill and obviously this goes into broader discussions about like how the unions carved out you know uh, mostly for white men and <laughs> goes into you know racial redlining and racial covenants and suburbanization and all that crap which you know we know and something to safeguard against uh we need to work against that kind of stuff so it's um and that was one thing though with the iup too which we found at least um promising was that it's a, one of the more diverse trade unions around and it's at least generally progressive um minded although they still are in the afl-cio so it's <laughs> 
and recently irritated me by having Kamala Harris talk um, at the Union Hall up here. So, <laughs> hey, so I remember when I was so I was going to get quickly like um, into like solidarity between co-ops. But I, I remember when I was there, y'all were trying out that um, I don't know how to pronounce it. BKLN, the um, maybe I should screen share it or something. This co-op. Um, it was just cool that uh, it was just cool that y'all were actually trying yeah. to use it and really mm -hmm. thinking about it. And I think you were planning to send um, a review, a review mm -hmm. to them about how the product was for like the different things y'all were doing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they're in a Brooklyn. Um, I think the BIPOC led a co-op in Brooklyn, and we do use their products, so it's it's cool. Yeah. And trying to connect more broadly we, we've been having conversations with folks up in madison and obviously in chicago and things like that so we're trying to keep those conversations up and that's actually and we we can talk about that like with the local because that's another thought if we could help because because like for instance people in madison have been having difficulty and Chris and I were just up there recently um, seeing some of the longstanding worker owned cooperatives. Uh, they've had some real difficulties in terms of unionizing because, because of these problems that we were talking about earlier, like um, if it makes sense or not. And, you know, then you've got the democratic buy, you know, you got to get democratic buy-in from everybody and, you know, you have different views about it and depending upon the CVA and what's involved, uh, it can make sense or, you know, doesn't at all. So, um, if we had this new local, then we would be able to to basically bring in cooper cooperatives into the local, um, and uh, so that 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 I think um, if you all are interested, um, we've started on some of the language on that. I don't know, Chris, if I sent you that, but um, w you know, we've been recently kind of reimagining that and trying to consider that um, how that would look. Um, last thing, Josh, and I'll throw it over to you, but, um, I know that, uh, new era windows in Chicago, I know they're looking for, um, I'm just putting this out there. Um, they're looking for people to, to give them, help them with some sales. So since you're, you're in that industry, they, they want like whoever, like you're working with, uh, where they're buying their windows from, they would like for it to be new era windows. Okay. So I was cool. putting that out there and you know what, there's, um, Let's see. I need to like get into their referral program or something. Check it out. Um, let me share my screen. <laughs> uh, I how, have y'all ever seen this stuff in among the, the co-ops? I, I wish I would see this stuff more. But New Era Windows has this referral program. Um, we should get a little better about this type of stuff, mm -hmm. like incentivizing other folks to help promote and sell other folks' products. Yeah. Um, for sure. I remember because they because they were they were a non cooperative form, right? When the boss oh yeah, right, because the boss tried to close it down and then they mm -hmm. took over. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, they were called a uh, uh, Re Republic Windows or something like that. New Republic Windows, mm -hmm. Republic Windows, and then they changed their name to, to this New Year. Yep. 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 Following and, a and they will long they, they will ship and... anywhere in the country. So uh, whoever's mm. listening to this, if you know someone who works anywhere near Windows, try to convince them to buy from New Era, they will ship to anywhere in the country. Awesome. Good. Cool. And they're in, uh looks like UE. They're a... Uh... Yep. Oh, cool. They're UE. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another union co-op. Um, yeah, and the union UE was pretty instrumental, as I understand it, in uh, helping them get set up uh, as a co-op, um, along with a lot of other support from you know, community members. Um, so hope that we'll be able to talk to them soon as well. Um, but on that kind of uh, cooperation among co-ops tip and maybe kind of expanding out beyond even just co-ops per se, you want to talk to us a little bit about Cooperation Milwaukee and uh, what that organization is all about? Yeah, for sure. Um, we, so, uh I guess the sort of the we kind of grew out of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of DSA and our relationships there. Um, 
uh, years ago. That was probably like 2018 ish. Um, then we established a uh, working group in DSA Milwaukee that was mostly focused on uh, mutual aid and solidarity economy, um, community assemblies, um, other forms of like counter power uh, that we um, established within the chapter. <clears throat> and we recently became completely and totally autonomous from DSA because of um, sort of what occurred here locally um, and which has also happened nationally, but um, just sort of uh, uh, what we perceive as sort of monopolization of power within the chapter. Uh, so we decided we kind of actually were sort of operating as a dual power within DSA, so we just sort of like migrated outside of it really e easily. So now we are actually a, a nonprofit. Um, we have nonprofit status. Uh, 501c4 or c3 uh, I can't remember <laughs> all those distinctions but uh, so we focus on a variety of things but um, right now uh, we do a lot of work around sort of cooperative economics uh, mutual aid community-based assemblies and um, those are kind of our three main we also have time banking uh, which hasn't entirely taken off yet but um, so that's kind of the you know, we have, we've had a kind of a new influx of members too, which is great. So we're, we're, uh, um, kind of between like 15 and 20 members. We do, uh, bi-weekly meetings and, uh, you know, we've got a number of spinoff groups. We're also working on a mental health cooperative, uh, that would be, um, uh, hope we're, we're, we're working through some of that. We've got all the bylaws down, mission and principles. Now we're, we're, we're also have like an LPC, licensed professional counselor, a nurse practitioner, or she's finishing her um, nurse practitioner course work, and then um, mediator and uh, a, a social worker, things like that um, sort of work together collectively to provide um, uh, individual and group therapy as well as like alternatives to calling the police, uh, decarceration, sort of like uh, abolitionist perspective um, on uh, mental health care in the community. Um, so that that grew out of Cooperation Milwaukee re relationships that we've kind of um, had going here, so. Hey, have, I, I'm gonna probably drop in the chat that I have with y'all, but there's um there's an org that we discovered this year called I think it's called Just Practice, and it's like a national org, and they have like this peer space where people like abolitionists are talking to each other about how they're trying to uh, navigate a lot of um uh, uh, basically like crises without involving uh, uh, law enforcement and all that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if y'all heard of it, but we, I've only been to one meeting. A friend of mine has been to two and it's, it's really cool, man. I mean, even, um, there's some folks that are like the last meeting I was at, I was like, okay, we're very far from doing that. But if we ever want to do that, we know like, okay, those are things to avoid or like, you know, how to scale back the work or whatever to fit people power. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to drop y'all. I'll That'd drop the great. link to y'all. Yeah. Um, and if y'all got more information, you want to join that, that space, I'll, I'll, uh, I find that information for you. That'd be great. Um, but hey, with the with the DSA, what was the conflict? What did did, did, did the chapter throw all all in for uh, the Bernie Bernie Sanders campaign or what? Uh, more like basically, they sort of they have like two campaigns. It's like uh, take over We Energies, which is the big you know energy monopoly here that, um, and they want to municipalize it, which you know is not wholly a bad thing or anything but the, like the strategy for them to do that is like pretty lackluster and uh not really i mean their, their their whole kind of idea is based on the sewer socialists which were big in milwaukee and we know sort of the history of that was victor Berger was like at the state level and he was like a notorious racist uh so that is a problem there uh obviously and then they they kind of had this uh, managerial, pers you know, socialist perspective where it's like, it wasn't really of the working class. It was sort of like that managerial bureaucratic socialism, 
um, that this particular local is like hearkening back to. They want to like, you know, be the, <laughs> it, so they, they really want to focus on this power of the people campaign. And then um, also like electoral politics, which, you know, we're not in alignment with at all. So it just became, uh, and then they've set really, in our opinion, like centralized power. And this isn't just um, folks in cooperation walking. These were like a number of DSA members who now have, many of them have joined up with us um, because they, they kind of like felt it and saw it happen before their eyes. And um, so we were able to offer like an alternative for them, you know, that uh, made sense. So, yeah, it's like kind of rigging and weaponizing a uh, democratic process, you know, uh, centralizing power into the executive committee, which is garbage anyway, because I was like, they don't have any real structural power over the the general assembly, you know, but they're acting as if they do. And, you know, basically created a, a situation where they're, they're like legitimize themselves through doing it, you know, um, and then you get a lot of younger members who don't know about the history. So then uh, they're able to take over. And I know that's happened in other chapters as well. Like some of the larger ones like New York, I've heard Atlanta, East Bay, stuff like that. So, yeah, we saw the same thing in Chicago like that. Um, I mean, if, if there there is like a cadre that controlled, at least when I was aware of what was going on with the, the, the Chicago DSA, there was a cadre that controlled it. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember one thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to work with create like with other DSA members to propose the idea of creating uh, neighborhood assemblies or you know street block assemblies, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, because there's this real big problem in the in like the Chicago DSA that I might, at the time it probably still exists today, which was like okay, socialism, yeah, well, socialism in general. How about we bring socialism to your block? Or, right. you know, instead of just like this abstract stuff. And right. um, and it would have supposed there's like a lot of energy for that. But then, you know, um, when we tried to see if we could like find ways to work with who lived in our neighborhood, who was a member, um, who um, or, or out, you know, closer to us, like we couldn't get access to any of that information. Um, the cadre uh, controlled it. Um, and you know, who wants to keep doing stuff like <laughs> what's like such basic democratic ideas? Who, who wants to be an organization where you're going to constantly face these kind of obstacles to just, you know, just getting access to your peers? You know? Right. Yeah, it seems to be sort of baked into the, the structure of DSA, too, where these things can occur, you know, um, even though they're supposed to be uh, what there's that they're not supposed to allow democratic centralist uh, organizers into DSA, but it's not really enforced. And yeah, like you said, like a cadre, I know I, I had heard that about Chicago, like Trotskyists, I think, or something like that. And, and, and I guess it kind of like reiterates our um, sort of perspective that like, maybe we, we, we do need to create our own institutions instead of, um trying to i don't know influence these large you know different institutions that might may, may we're not really ideologically aligned with you know or tactically aligned with uh whatever it might be structurally so yeah it kind of really allows for a lot of that to happen so we just saw it happen in real time here which we're just like Ugh, you know yeah i remember uh we had a a friend that was in rocheva and they're like wanted me to get support in the DSA for Rojava and Rojava has its co-ops too. Mm -hmm. And um, they're like, man, but be careful of these DSA members, man. They're Syrian nationalists. Like they, oh. they side with like the Assad socialism or whatever. And there is a big difference though. Cause like there's right. cooperators in Rojava who they're like, we're recovering from that. Like that socialism they had, uh -huh. we, you know, we want food autonomy. They use food against us. There was right. like the state, the state um, stores for food, but they use it as leverage against us because we, we didn't produce our own food locally. Um, so yeah, bizarre stuff, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it gets really out there with, yeah, then it gets like tanky-ish, right? <laughs> well, uh, I mean. Uh. And, this, and this is why we 
or at least I much prefer uh, the stuff that goes on in worker co-ops to the stuff that goes on in political organizations. Uh, it's been a while since I've uh, personally involved myself uh, when I was, you know, I, I did a lot of issue campaigns and stuff. I live in, in, in Montana where we have never seen a DSA chapter, I don't think ever. I'd at least never heard of one when I was being very politically active in that type of way. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, uh, much prefer worker co-op where, you know, uh, in order to have some say, you got to at least be doing some work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's yeah. not that there aren't issues. We've right. certainly run into plenty of issues in the co-op world. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, 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 it's definitely... Uh, a refreshing uh, change for me. Um, it's it's we, um, yeah. But yeah. So, uh, what else do we need to talk about? We got another fifteen minutes or so. Um, yeah. Is there anything in particular, uh, Jay, that you think we should have asked you to to get at some of the interesting stuff about Flora or Cooperation Milwaukee that we failed to? Um, not immediately, but, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the idea of, uh, this local, if, if that made sense. Yeah. 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 I, I, and I didn't, I didn't quite follow exactly what you were getting at. So it does, um, yeah, yeah. Give us the, the detailed explanation. For sure. Yeah. So part of it, um, well, sort of the idea and actually I'm going to pull it up here real quick. Um, sort of the idea behind it is, um, I'll, I'll just read the first, um, paragraph. Y'all cool with that? Yeah. So, um, then this is, this is, you know, we still need to edit this. We need to work through it collectively, but, uh, sort of the idea, um, is the international union of painters and allied trades local 161 we just put that as a place mark uh, of cooperators artists cultural workers freelancers gig workers and independent contractors is a local of workers organizing in our respective industries to representing a class of workers typically marginalized by the current political economy and committed to engendering creating and supporting union worker owned cooperative enterprises and shared resources these marginalized workers typically operate in industries that are currently not collectively organized such as freelancers gig workers artists cultural workers and other forms of precarious labors as well as the unemployed local 161 was formed specifically to work in solidarity with the broader labor movement and to address and combat precarity exploitation wage theft misclassification and job insecure, insecurity in a variety of industries. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's kind of the, the thought behind it and sort of like a way of unionizing people who are, you know, in these particular industries that are, um, yeah. So I don't know if you guys have questions or anything. I mean, pops is the idea here kind of to have a union that's kind of like the everything else category, the like miscellaneous, you know, like gig workers. And, you know, it, it, I mean, it seems like maybe that's, is that what you're trying to get at? Like people for whom there isn't any kind of existing union mm -hmm. structure necessarily to join apart from maybe like the IWW, but you know, they, you know, if you're in, you know, an Uber driver, like, uh, yeah, I don't know what you, what they've got for you or a, or a, or a so is that, you just trying to is, is you trying to reach people who maybe don't have an option to join any other kind of union is that the idea yeah that's the thought and and also for cooperators too that have difficulty navigating these contractual bargaining agreements like we mm -hmm. talked about earlier so mm -hmm. there could be specifically um focused on cooperators and then other you know so I guess the idea is too that like a lot of folks, just like in contracting, you get a lot of people who are independent contractors who maybe have a skill set and then they, you know, they sell their labor skill set to a general contractor, um, and then they might re uh, reproduce sort of the you know capitalist firm model. So they might have like one or two other subs that are working under them, and it's like so everybody's exploiting everybody else. <laughs> um, and so like to fight against some of that um, problem, but then also with artists and cultural workers who are 
oftentimes, uh, you know, it's like a drive to the bottom, right? So it's like an artist might produce um, like murals, you know, let's say, and then it's, it, there's no standardized bill rate of any sort whatsoever, you know, corporate, bigger, larger capitalist corporate firms might, you know, hire a, a, a muralist to do some, you know, maybe they'll have a contract, but there's, there's no, um, uniform contract for instance so if we could provide help with some of those things or how should you, you know uh, if you have a pool of artists that you could work with on a bigger project like you could come to the union right and um, um work together rather than be competitive because there's so much hyper competition that occurs with the arts you know um mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and sort of like what's the similarity between all these is you know neoliberalism uh has like you know it's like oh well you're an independent contractor it's like so you get to choose your own schedule and da -da 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 -da, but you're only going to make 20 bucks an hour and you have to use your own car like in the case of uber or lyft and it's like uh actually all of the onus is falling onto you and your car and your vehicle and your insurance and all that and then you know uber is making you know so how do you collectivize people who are in disparate industries um and the reason why we're so exploited is because we're often individualized into these separate um yeah you know you know what i mean well, even separate mm -hmm. cars in the case of uber it's really difficult to um unionize and, and even maybe broadening it to uh like restaurant workers are you know basically sub nine uh subcontractors right of the restaurant especially mm -hmm. like i don't know how it is in chicago necessarily but in milwaukee it's like i think it's like three 33 an hour plus benefits or tips so you don't there's no benefits um yeah maybe one night you walk home with 100 200 bucks maybe if it's a really good night but you're basically a subcontractor of the restaurant the restaurant is only paying 233 and 23 233 mm -hmm. or 333 an hour and then covering your workers comp well workers comp is like next to nothing on 233 and an hour and only pays out if you get injured. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those kind of uh, gifts that you hope you don't ever have to receive. You know, or you know, it's, right. it's like I hope you don't ever be have to benefit from your workman's comp. But uh, right. <laughs> yeah, so that's a that's a okay. So that's a interesting. Have you had a a lot of uh, interest in this in this idea? Uh, how many? Yeah, so well, that's what. So we're, we're actually getting to the point where we have to figure out. And I just spoke with some folks up in Madison and um, about it. And um, so we're we're getting some interest that way. We depending on which way we go, like with the IUPAT, if we go that route, we have to get fifty signers, um, mm -hmm. and then we forge our own local. The the issue with IUPAT or being in that is well one it's it's a part of a broader trade union which is great and it's got zone benefits we could possibly opt in or opt out of some of their packet benefits packages mm -hmm. um but the other issue is we have to abide by the international constitution which you know is its right. own thing although as a local you can kind of operate my understanding is you can kind of operate without it's like they use robert's rules for instance i'm like we're not going to use sure. robert's no way <laughs> um we I second that is consensus you know <laughs> yeah so like we should be able to 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 do a lot of our own things in our local but then it's like you still you're still paying money to the international so then we're like what if we did it under iww and as more of like a committee or a council under um or an mm -hmm. industrial union sector or something i think it would be like a branch like an industrial union branch so we have to kind of like figure some of that stuff out and then you know, IWW doesn't have any benefits package that are portable. So it's like, these are questions we need to right. kind of flesh out and figure out. My UE um, always, you know, is one that jumps to mind as like a, a, a good union, which I only really became aware of how exactly how cool they were uh, after a, a food co-op uh, seminar, kind of webinar that we had. And uh, we had a, a employee from uh, a food co-op. Um, who was a union member at uh, UE, and she uh, went on and on about their, you know, uh, how they're organized and they're, ex you know, incredibly democratic, you know, very democratic structure, and uh, and uh, yeah, seemed very aligned. So I don't know if you've looked at UE or not, but that might be another option for. 
Yeah, we have it, and yeah, we we have we've kind of briefly talked about it, but I I, I should talk to somebody. I mean, one of Cooperation Milwaukee members, their dad is a longtime UE member. UE is no longer exists. The local doesn't exist here anymore because uh, they used to be associated with Rockwell Automation, which is a huge uh, uh, engineering firm, and like that local got disbanded. Uh, I think there is the remnants of it though here, so definitely worthwhile looking into, but. It's like UE, I don't know. I, I, yeah, because I know they do support a lot of co op. So, yeah, yeah, but yeah. There's the really... UE Hall in Chicago. I've been to the office in Chicago. If yeah. that's ever useful, I can go down there. Cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I saw, um, I, I'm losing time for my paranormal question that I want to ask. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I feel like I should, I should ask this, though, at the expense of that question. So, is it, would it be like, a general membership branch under the IWW and then the other, the second question. So I think I know the answer to this, but I, I think I should still ask it. How would it be different from a general membership branch in the IWW? Yeah. Um, my understanding, I was talking to AJ in the shop here and AJ was saying that I would probably be an industrial union branch. So, mm -hmm. It would be its own rather than a local it would be a a brand and if we wanted it to be more regional like if it went from chicago to milwaukee to um, madison for instance um it could be like a regional industrial union branch because it would be because the way that iww is structured typically it's like your industry it's like an iu right like industrial union 330 is like construction uh so i don't know if we'd have to like create our own that was like basically like cooperators artists cultural workers you know like um so those are details we got to figure out yeah so the thought is like it's a broader way of organizing and some some idea behind like having some of like a larger trade union that's got some money behind it is like hey um if you all are interested in this you know maybe you could send some money our way to like organize you know uh because because they do like they have paid staffers for instance like iww doesn't right so it's like there's it's basically like uh all rank and file driven and you got to be super passionate about it and you know make it happen on the shop floor which is great but you know we're all at different capacities and depending on what industry you're in it could be you could be looking at a really uphill battle and if you don't have a lot of support from like paid paid organizers you know I, I i can see the sort of value of like a both you know like paid organizers and then you get into bureaucratic you know nonsense of a lot of these larger unions you know but on the other hand if you don't have that then resources resource allocation is difficult then uh you know you know it'd be a big battle <laughs> Yeah, right, everything's right, right for it to be white, white led, and led by upper middle class or rich people. Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a problem. I, I mean, a, a real conundrum, and you kind of put your finger on it, Jay, as to the this kind of trying to strike the balance between professionalization mm -hmm. and you know paying people to do this kind of work um, versus you know the problem that you know Chris is pointing out that is if you if you don't you know, do that, right? I think is what you're getting at, that the people who uh, end up being able to volunteer and do all the work for free are, yeah, tend to be wealthier and whiter than average. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, I mean, it, and we've had this conversation a lot within worker co-ops and co-op organizing. Um, I, you know, I think it was Melba Smith uh, was, you know, longtime uh, cooperative organizer in the black community in the Southeast. And, you know, she was talking about how back in this fifties and sixties and seventies that none of them ever thought about being paid for doing their cooperative organizing stuff. Whereas nowadays, a lot of most co-op organizing is being done by paid people who are being paid, or at least to some extent being paid. I think a lot of us are kind of, you know, partial volunteers, partially being paid. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's um and, and, yeah and so yeah you know the the economy has changed of course a lot since you know 40 50 years ago 
Um, you know, not quite so easy to get by on a single income in a family and stuff like that. Um, but so we, you know, maybe need to be paying people more to make sure this stuff gets done. But then we do run into the problems of professionalization, bureaucratization. It ends up being a competition for, you know, to move up the move up the ladder and get the bigger next bigger paycheck in the in the org, mm -hmm. just like everything else. So um, I don't know that there are any good answers. I haven't figured them out. If you guys figure them out, let us know for sure. What the right <laughs> balance yeah. to strike is. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like cooperation walking for instance. I mean, nobody, we don't get paid for any of that. You know, it's like, and I don't think anybody's looking for it. Um, but you're right. Like it leads to this imbalanced situation where um, the people who have the time and, you know, something goes into sort of like, you know, what y'all are talking about, but it's like, the pe yeah like whoever has the time to do it then ends up taking on you know a lot of the so it kind of has this whoever can do it can do it and then um but 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 who can't you know or can pitch in as they have time or energy to do it um but yeah there's a i i think we're so used to doing everything um unremunerated that it feels like somewhat disingenuous to try to get paid for it right and i think cooperatives have a, a unique position in that because you're still you're dealing with the sale of goods and services right so it's like it's just sort of like you're part of that larger capitalist system and we're trying to do an alternative within that um where people are getting remunerated for their labor um yeah but yeah um well, uh, it's been a very interesting, enlightening conversation, Jay. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us, and um, really excited to hear about uh, Flora and uh, Cooperation Milwaukee. And uh, best of luck with all of that. Uh,